Perfect. Perfect. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, Clive Must Barkley's here. Yeah. All right, for Clive. Uh, who knows when it is? Spring, spring back holiday, it says in my diary, on Thursday, and GB on Friday. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Gentlemen. Good evening. Nice to see you, Michael. Nice to see you, Ivor. Nice to have two other people watching on Zoom, and we have people listening on Facebook Live as well as Tara Anytime. As always, a big thank you, Tara Anytime, for hosting this year and so much other great Torah content. Check it out, TorahAnytime.com. <laughs> wow, what a way to start a year. Okay, pardon? That was a, that was a great way to start your year. Okay, now, um, we're going to discuss tonight a few interesting ideas about Pashas Bamidbar. It didn't make a mistake, really. What I should have done is I should have also had something on Megillas Rus, and I didn't prepare anything, so I do apologize that we don't have anything on Megillus Rus. Normally, we would have something on Megillus Rus as part of Erish Rus, totally in my own little world, so I do apologize for that. Okay, so we want to, first of all, understand the following. There'd be two similar ideas that come up over here, and I'd like to maybe go through those two ideas first and then go back to see other things. The first idea is this idea of the encampments. We have the Jewish people are not told that they're going to be counted yet again. It is now in the second month, which is the month of Ear, in the second year after they've come out of Egypt. And we are now at the stage where we're going to have a count. God says, So we want to count all of the Jewish people, according to the families, according to the households, their father's households, all the different males from 20 years old up to 60 years old. And God also sets aside people from every single tribe. They're going to help Moshe Rabbeinu now count these people. And then once we finish counting them, we move into the next thing. And which is the following. We're looking at chapter two, Parag Base, And we start in, we can start on Bosak Aleph even. Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aaron saying, Ish al-digla a person on to the banner for his the signs for his father's household. Yachanu and saw the Jewish people should encamp. They surround the Oa Moed, and that's where they will encamp. So now each person gets a flag. Okay? So, and then he starts telling you who's going to be on which side. So we have Yehuda is going to be on the east, and who's going to be with him, Yehuda and Yisachar and Zbulun, and then you have Reuven, and then you have Ephraim, and then you have Don, and each one of them has their encampment with two other Shavatim, and in the middle you have Levi, and in the middle of that, you have the Mishkan. So it's very strange, because it would seem until now, there was no official encampments, almost. Now we're telling you, everybody's got to get themselves a flag, and everybody's got to put themselves into specific areas. So Yehuda will be on the east together with Yisachar and together with Zebulun. And then you'll have Ruvain on the west. And Ruvain, let's see, where's Ruvain? Sorry, my mistake. Ruvain is going to be in the south and he's going to be together with God. And he's also going to be together with Shimon. And then you have Ephraim, which is going to be in the west. And Ephraim is going to be together with Menashe and with Ephraim, Menashe, and Binyamin. And then you have Don, and Don's going to be together with Osher and Aftali, and they are going to be in the north. That is the encampment of the Jewish people. They encamp around. And each one of them, we don't read about it here in Mephorish, but each one of them had their own flag. And sort of, it almost became like a league. Everybody came teams. So what team do you support? Or oh, you support the Blues. What team do you support, Ivor? You probably don't support teams. You, you don't look the sport kind of guy. I'm a little are you actually a Liverpool, Liverpool supporter? Oh, by osmosis from Phil. All right. That's one way that it works. Okay. So you were probably unhappy on Matzah Shabbos about what happened. Very unhappy. Okay. Michael was happy last week. You were unhappy this week. Okay. Twice unhappy. Once losing the Premier League and then again losing the Champions League one after the other. You, you really got hammered. What should I tell you? Okay. Not to worry. There's always next year, right? Okay. That's true. That's true. Anyway. So... You get into people, people get very, very funny. They get almost very territorial about their teams. 
So if you have a look at what happened on Shabbos afternoon, or Saturday for them, in Paris, yeah, the Stade de France, they have been having all sorts of issues over there, the police being heavy-handed, and did the police attack the people, and they didn't attack the people. And nowadays, you, it, it's very hard to say what really happened because every person with a smartphone starts taking pictures and uploading them. So the police will say, we never hit anybody. And they're like, oh, yeah? Here you go. Look at this. And, you know, we weren't heavy-handed. Oh, you don't call this heavy-handed? Look at this. This looks pretty heavy-handed. And they're saying that the Liverpool supporters made too many fake tickets. And the Liverpool supporters said they were heavy-handed against us. They weren't fair. And our people didn't get what they were supposed to. And they were treated badly. There was all this stuff going on at the same time. Right? Pretty crazy stuff. Yeah? And what's it all about, really, in the end of the day? Teams. It's my team against your team. And my team's going to win, and your team's going to lose, and my team's more important than your team, and my team has better players than your team, and I hope that my team's always going to win. And even if your team is better than my team, I still believe that my team will beat your team. It's all that going on. We're turning people into teams. And if you want to see, I know it's very funny, you have in certain households where you have different children that support different clubs. So if your kids are like sort of supporters, it's no big deal. So I have one red and one blue at home, and big deal. Because none of them are big support. I mean, Mayor likes his blues, but you know he's not crazy about them. But where you have families that are really intense about football, the fact that one supports one team and one supports another team can become extremely divisive. It really does. And families can split and fight. You know, some families have said, we just agree not to talk about football because every time we talk about football, it turns into an argument. Who said what? And why do they say it? And he's right or he's wrong and he's goading me and he said that my team is going to lose and it's not really going to lose and he's making fun of me. He's making fun of our players, making fun of our coach, making fun of our manager. It's very, very... People get very funny about their team. And so therefore, what Rav Yaakov Kavanetsky points out over here is the following. It's very interesting that we should have the Jewish people suddenly split up into teams. You're going to be Ruven, you're going to be Shimon, you're going to be Levi, you're going to be Yehuda. You're going to have your own flag. You're going to have your own area. And it starts to make almost a, so what side are you on? Oh, I'm on the Ruvain side. <laughs> ah, I'm on the Yehuda side. See, I come from the tribe of Yehuda. Different to you. We go in the front and we encamp on the eastern corner. You guys, yeah, you're Ruvain. You're not really that great. It starts to turn almost into bragging rights. So what are we doing? Why are we taking the Jewish people and creating a system where people would start to argue with each other? Why do we want encampments and why do we want flags and why do we want all of that? Yeah, but how do you create unity by putting everybody on their own team? Unity will be for everybody. Let's just all have one flag. It's called the Jewish flag. And then it will have a lot. Like, like, like I know, you take the American, the American flag, right? So American flag has 50 stars because the 50 stars correspond to 50 states. It's meant to be that all 50 states, these are the United States of America. And we have one flag, not that Florida has its own flag and New York has its own flag. And I think they still do. I think they do have some kind of their own. Yeah, they have state legislature and they have, uh, you know, uh, they have different mascots and different names. This is the Sunshine State. And this is the Empire State. And this is the Garden State. You have all sorts of different names that go with it. But in the end of the day, it, it still... We want to have a unified Jewish people. And what we're doing over here does not lend itself to unity. So why would we do that? Why would we create this lack of harmony amongst the Jewish people, split them into teams and give everybody their flag and their, everybody their place rather than just keeping everybody all together? Okay. Well, there will be a good reason over here. So it's interesting. And why did it take so long? Why did it take until now? It seems before then there was no discussion about who encamps where. Suddenly now there's a discussion who's encamping where, which is interesting because really it should be earlier also. So what Ryakov Kamenetsky says over here is the following. We have a, we're looking at it the wrong way. So if I were to say to you, these are 12 different teams, you'd say, well, 12 teams. One is Arsenal and one is West Ham and one is Liverpool and one is Tottenham and one is City and one is United. So each one of them is in a different area and each one of them has a different fan base and has a different stadium and it's my team against your team, et cetera, et cetera. Then that's really problematic. But what have we just had that we didn't have until now? So the Jewish people came out of Egypt. 
They encamped at Har Sinai. There's a certain amount of achtos there. Then they have the golden calf. After the golden calf, they have Yom Kippur. God forgives them. After that, they start to build the Mishkan. And now on the first day of Nisan, so just a month prior to that, God placed his Mishkan, he placed his tabernacle in the middle of all of the Jewish people. He places Levi around there. And then he places the Jewish people around the Mishkan. And so Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says a beautiful idea. If I were to say to you, we have 12 different teams, you'd say 12 different teams creates a tremendous amount of arguments. But what if I were to say to you, we don't have 12 different teams. We have one team with 12 players. So is the goalkeeper upset at the striker for not taking the goal? Or is the striker upset at the goalkeeper for not coming to the front and helping them out on a counterattack? No. The goalkeeper needs to stay in goal to watch the goal. The striker needs to move to the front when he gets a chance to try and score. The midfielder creates chances, the defender is trying to defend. And each one of them, you got the left back and the right back, and you got a center back, and then you got the guy in the forward, you got the center forward, and you got the right and the left side. Everybody's got their own position. So you pay the number nine position or the number 10 position or the number 11 position, there are three different positions in football, right? So number 10 is the most important one. You put them straight on the snack in the middle, all the way at the front, hoping that this guy's going to score the most goals. That's your guy that you're waiting for. The guy who's playing five or six is playing a different position. And each one has, they all have their own position. And what they do is they, um, just one second, that's Mofi back in. They all encamp around the same team. They're all part of the same team, and they all see themselves as part of one group that's there to do something. It's not I'm the defender and you're something else, and therefore I don't talk to you and you don't talk to me. It's very, very different. And therefore, we've now placed the Mishkan in the middle of the Jewish people. We create the Mishkan in the midst of the Jewish people. And since we place the Mishkan in the midst of the Jewish people, what we now have is we have a focus. And everybody all around focuses where? Towards the middle. And the middle is Hashem. Hashem says, look, I got my Mishkan over here. I want from different people, I want different things. And I want all of you to specifically do different jobs. But not that the tribe of Ruvain is another team to the tribe of Yehuda. We're all teams. We're all players on the same team, on the God team, on the Jewish people team. Now the Jewish people split into 12 teams. And therefore, but you can only have that once you have a centralized place. You take the Mishkan, you stick it in the center, and you put everything else around it, and everybody now has a focus. And that changes everything else around. Now suddenly I don't see 12 different teams. I see 12 people around the same thing, wanting the same thing, but each one doing their own job. And that's really important because I think within the Jewish people, it's important to note that there are many different jobs. There are many different types of people and different people have different jobs. You know, so there'll be people that are job is to teach Torah. There are people whose job it is to support Torah. There are people whose job it is to be askonim, to be busy themselves with communal matters and to help the community move forward. There are people who are just there to make up the numbers so that, you know, you can have people that say, you know, I, I'm a mini man every day. Right? I come to Minya every single day. What do you do for the shul? Nothing actively, but without me, many, many times, it wouldn't be a minion. If you've not done any active role, and yet you take a very, very important role in the shul also. Everybody has a role to play within the big team. But only once we have the focus of the team in the middle, can we then split everybody into different groups and say, you are now, your job is to do A, your job is to do B, and your job is to do C. But you're all doing the same thing. We can't have 100 rabbis in a community. We can't have 100 chazanim in the community. We can't have 100 wardens in a community. It doesn't work. You need one of each. Or sometimes you have more than one rabbi, sometimes you have more than one chaz, sometimes you even have more than one warden. But you'll have a certain amount, and they do their job. And it's not for the rabbi to tell the chazan which songs to sing. And it's not for the rabbi to tell the gamai whom he needs to call up. That's the warden's job. He can remind the one who says, oh, by the way, do you think so-and-so needs an aliyah because he got your side? Oh, I almost missed him. Thank you. 
right? But the warden makes the call. So if he makes the right call, then he gets all the reward for it. If he makes the wrong call, then get the, you get the, he'll take the flag for it. But everybody's got their job. And we all work around the same center. And that changes the perspective entirely. Is that we need to work together. Each one of us doing our thing for Hashem. So that together, we make a great unit. You can't do it differently. Okay? And now we move on from that to the next bit, which is very similar to this. I saw this, the Chofetz Chaim, al Torah, speaks about this. And he tells us how we, how we moved. So after that, we read as follows. This is in Parag Base, Pasuk Yudzayim. So we told you, first of all, that you have the encampment of Yehuda. Who's in the encampment of Yehuda? How many people each one of the tribes had and that they went first. Then the second encampment was Machane Reuven, who were in the south. With Reuven, you said you had Shimon and God. How many each one of them had? Who their Nasi, who the prince was? And then that they went second. And now after the first two sets of encampments, six tribes have moved. Minasa Omoid, the Omoid travels Machane Alevim, the encampment of the Vim Besocha Machnas, amongst in the middle of everybody else. Kashe Yachnu can you so just as they encamp, so they also travel. Isha Yadoda Diglem, each one according to their place, according to their banners. And then we move on to the third set, which is Ephraim, and the last set is done. Okay? And they all travel in that direction. Says the Chavetz Chaim, there's a very important thing to realize over here in the way that they travel. They did not travel putting the Mishkan and the Levim first. The Levim traveled the Soch Hamachanos. In the middle of everybody else is where the Levites travel. So why do we have the Levim traveling in the middle? Why don't they travel at the front? You'd expect the Torah and the Levim should go on the front. And again, it's the same idea or similar idea that Chavetz Chaim speaks about over here. That he changes it around slightly to say that there is no aristocracy in Torah. Okay? I'm no more of a Jew than you are. Okay? We're both the same level Jews. So I, do, I might do my things and you do your things. I'm a rabbi. You're the optician. You know, you have your mitzvahs and you have your way of serving God. I have my mitzvahs and my way of serving God. But I'm not a better Jew than you. You know, if we were to say, who's more Jewish? Neither. I'm not more Jewish than you or than you, and you're not more Jewish than me. We're all the same. So much so that if somebody to walk in, let's say Hans Vashon terrorists were to walk in and to say, the most important Jew in this room, I'm going to spare, and the others I, I you know, other, the others I won't. The other ones will all get killed. Who's the most important Jew in this room? There is no vote. You can't vote and say, oh, the most important Jew is that guy. Ramam says, and everybody says, okay, there's nobody most important. You have to let everybody get, get killed. Why? Because I can't choose who's most important. The Gemara says, why is your blood rather than his? Who says that you are more of a person or more of a Jew than he is? Maybe it's the other way around. You don't know God's calculations. So there's no such thing as an aristocracy. We're Machane Levi, and therefore we are better than everybody else. No, we have a different job to everybody else. But really, Machane Levi travels besoch hamachanos. It travels in the middle of all of the other camps, in the middle of the encampments. Why? So that everybody should know. The Levim don't go in the front and say, oh, we're aristocracy, we're better than you, and everybody else travel behind us. That's not how it goes. We travel in the middle, and everybody encamps around us. We are the center. We, the Levim, okay, I'm not a Levi, but the Levim were the ones that had the jobs of doing the avod on the base of Mikdash, they had the jobs of doing the service in the temple, and therefore they are the ones that travel together with the Mishkan, but not because they're better. It's just their job to shut the Mishkan. And then you have everybody else around them, and everybody surrounds it with a focus on the middle, focusing back on this, on the Torah, and our joint responsibility towards the Torah. And then he says something very interesting, the Chavetz Chaim, which is actually historically interesting. Historically speaking, the Bima has always been where? In the middle. Okay? The Ahmad might have been a little bit further to the front, but the Bima, where you read the Torah from, has always been in the middle. Until 
the 1800s. In the early 1800s, what happened was reform started to sweep away German Jewry. And when reform started to make its way into German Jewry, what people wanted to do, what were the early reformers, what were they actually trying to mimic? The church. The early reform weren't trying to get rid of religion, but rather they're reforming the Jewish religion to be a lot more like the Christian religion. So, for example, the idea of canonicals started then. Why did rabbis suddenly start wearing canonicals? They look very, they look very priest-like, don't they? Yeah, because we wanted the rabbis and the chazan to look slightly priest-like. We wanted to give them, just like the priest at the front has his robes, we want to give the rabbis robes at the front. So suit's not good enough, frock's not good enough. We need a guy in canonicals. And that's what happened. Okay? There are other things. For example, chuppahs moved inside. All weddings moved inside. And that's why, by the way, in the Haredi sector, you'll never find a first marriage. Second marriage is yes, but you'll never find a first marriage that is being held indoors. And there are many rabbonim, very, very choshev rabbonim, that will tell you that if they want, if you want to be Masonic Yudushin indoors, they are not going to be Masonic Yudushin indoors. Even though marrying outdoors is only a minhag. It's only a minute because you do it under Kippa Shemayim because God blessed Avraham Avinu to say you should be like the stars of the earth. So you do it under the heaven so that you should get that bracha be like the stars of the earth. It's only an Indian. That's not like a halacha. That's, but what happened was is the reform came forward and said we need to bring all the weddings inside. Why? Because who got married indoors in the church? The guy did. The non-Jews did. So, Visa Christel, there's a famous Yiddish saying that the Jews want to mimic the Christians. So we wanted to mimic them, so we brought it inside. So at that point, the Hassam Sofer, who was a, a fierce opponent of the reform in the 1800s, Hassam Sofer says, if you have a wedding that's been conducted indoors, it cannot go ahead. You're not allowed to... And that's why I know Dan Weston, for example, said to me at the time, he doesn't do any indoor weddings. You want to get married in Dan Weston, that's how I wanted to be the Masonic tradition, had to be outdoors. No such thing as indoors. Again, second marriage is different. The halacha is by second marriage, you have the marriage indoors. But by the first marriage, halacha is you should have it outdoors. The better way of doing it is having it outdoors. We have it indoors, we have it indoors, we're not so much, but in the, you know, in the United Synagogues and many other schools are not as particular. But, or what you have in a lot of places, what I've seen is you have like a sukkah roof. So you put the chuppah directly under the sukkah roof, you open up the sukkah roof, everybody else is dry, and the couple stands outside. Okay, whatever you're going to do. But the couple is still tachas kipas shemain. You're still under the heaven. So why did we make such a big fuss? Because the reform are trying to undo things. And when the reform are trying to undo Judaism, the Hassam Sofer went to the nth degree to fight them. So that even though it's not really halacha that you cannot get married indoors, what ended up happening is what? They made a thing now. If anybody gets married indoors, that's like that's trying to be like a guy. That's trying to be non-Jewish. Forget it. No such thing. Not getting married like that. So now comes another thing that they did. You go in a reform temple and you'll find the bima is all the way at the front. There's no bima in the middle. Is it? All the way at the front? I'm trying to think what Wilburn Road is like. I've been to Wilburn Road. Is it literally all the way at the front? Don't remember that. Yeah, everyone's at the back and the beam is at the front. Yes. Yes. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Interesting that they do that in Wilburn Road, right? So there are people that would say they wouldn't have in such a show where they've taken the beam and put it all the way at the front. It's a very Germanic congregation. It's a very Germanic congregation. Yeah. So that's what it is. So the Germanic congregations wanted to copy the Germanic churches that all have the altar at the front there's nothing in the middle in a church in the, in the middle is where the people sit right but you have the altar at the front and you got the guy standing at the front the priest standing at the front and everything happens at the front well they actually i mean i know he goes through with like i don't know what they go through with uh, with, uh, with the incense or something and at one point another he walks through. but the main action is at the front yeah I mean, I mean i've never been to church service i can't really tell you what happens there yes the 
That you can have. And many shows look in base Mordechai, you'll have that in Shah Mordechai, you'll have that. Lots of the shows. The, but the Bima is it is in the middle, right? Whereas the Chazan Davins, so here we Davin is actually interesting because United Synagogue comes from Spanish and Portuguese Jews that made their way from Amsterdam to London because the Jews had gotten kicked out of England. So there were no Jews in England for 300 years. I think between the 1300s and the 1600s, there were no Jews. And then Rabbi Menashe in Israel, who was the chief rabbi of Amsterdam, convinced Oliver Cromwell to take the Jews back. And there were Jews that moved from Amsterdam to London. And the Jews that moved from Amsterdam to London brought with them their Smarty heritage. And if you've ever been to a Smarty Shul, where does the Smarty, where does the Chazan Dam from in a Smarty Shul? In the middle. They're down in the middle. There is no, but Ashkenazim, if you go to the Ashkenazim, like the more Ashkenazi shuls, you will find actually that there is a, an Omud at the front. That's what's called, it's called the Omud, and that's where the Chazan Dams is all the way at the front. But the Bima, where they read the Torah from, is in the middle. Or towards, it, it doesn't have to be smack in the center, right? Even here, it's not smack in the center. It's behind me, but there's still seats over there and behind it as well. So it's still in the middle of the congregation. So why did, he says, so why did we move the Bima to the front? Why did the bima go to the front? So the Chavetz Chaim says a very interesting thing. He says, besides the historical reason of wanting to mimic the non-Jews, it also with it, and this is a real problem, it carried a certain subliminal message with it. And the subliminal message was, the Torah goes on the front with the rabbi, the chazan, you know, the top people in the front, they have to keep the Torah. The people at the Jew in the pew doesn't need it. Or it's not his obligation. Take the Torah, Rabbi sits in the front, Chazan sits over there, President over there, move the Torah near them. Yeah, you guys can keep the Torah. We don't have to keep the Torah. Move the Torah away from us. And that's really what happened. In all, a lot of those congregations, basically the Torah ceased to be their way of life. Very much in the reform congregations, that's what happened. We don't look at the Torah as our way of life. It's a nice historical thing. It's a nice cultural thing. It's a nice traditional thing, but it's not an obligation. And the community themselves don't have to keep to the laws of the Torah. Not at all. We've changed them. There's reason to change them. That's the old days. Now it's the modern days. You want somebody keeping the Torah? Yeah, you find one or two people at the front keeping the Torah. If the rabbi keeps the Torah, if, Right. Not always is that true either. You know, the reform congregations that have rabbis that are atheists. I mean, that's that's just boggles the mind. And his yeah. Husband, and his husband as well. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's mad. Right? But you take the Torah stick in the front, you say, this is for the aristocracy of the shul. The rabbi, the chazan, the president, the warden, they can keep the Torah. Everybody in the middle doesn't have to do it. And we say, no, no, the bima, the Torah goes in the middle of everybody. We take the Torah and stick in the middle of everybody else because it's the focus of everybody. Some shuls even have where the entire congregation faces, instead of facing Mizrach, they face the bima. They have it in our shul, actually, the main shul. You know, everyone's facing towards where the Torah is. The Torah is being read in the middle. And you have the people are sitting in the front facing the bima, people on the sides facing the bima. Pardon? Not all of them. The ones on the bima, yeah. yeah. They all the pews aren't sideways. They would. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. They have the front and the front. They have two rows facing back, but most of the rows are facing forward in yeah. Main Street. Yeah. Do they have some facing the bima as well? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay, but in our shul, certainly everybody's we're facing towards the middle. We're not facing forwards. Okay, facing the mima because the Torah is the central point of Judaism. And so we all focus ourselves towards that middle point. We put the Torah in the middle. We focus towards that middle and that's how we do it. Okay, and that's again the same idea. That's why we have the encampment of the 12 tribes around and everybody gets their own tribe because now that you have the Torah as your focus, you can split everybody up to 12 tribes and it's not going to create a hatred between them. It's not going to create a rivalry between them, but rather it's going to be each one sees themselves as having their job within the greater scheme of things of Torah. And the Torah belongs in the middle, and that's why the Torah travels in the middle, because there's no aristocracy like that. We don't do that. Okay? Um, one last idea, I guess, because we spoke about reform and everything is an interesting idea as well. So you have, uh, at the beginning of the Pasha, 
you have the names of all of the different people that were the Nisim. So you have on page 726 of the article, Parak Aleph, Pasuk. Which one is this? Vav, sorry. Pasuk Vav. Le Shimon. So you go, we go back to Pasuk Hey, even define. These are the names of the people that stand with you. Le for the tribe of Reuben, El Itzur Ben Shideo. Le Shimon for the tribe of Shimon, Shalumiyam and Sereshadai. Shalumiel is very, I mean, it's very from. Shalumiel means Shalom, Kel, Shalom to God. Ben Suri Shaddai, that Sur, my rock, God is my rock. So peace unto God and God is my rock. This is a very, very religious name. Okay. At the same time, notes of Zaman Sarotskin that this individual, Shlumi Abin Suri Shaddai, is known as something else at a later date. His name is Zimri Ben Salu. And Zimri Ben Salu should be famous for us from the end of Pasha's Bolak and the beginning of Pasha's Pinchas, because we read about the Jewish people staying in a place called Shittim. And in this place, they started to commit holotry with the daughters of Moab. And you have a very famous individual come forward and Pinchas, and he has a relationship in front of everybody else with a Midianite woman. Pinchas kills him. And then we read in, on page 876, if you're looking it up, the person, the Jewish person that was killed, that was killed together with a Midianite woman, Zimri ben Salu. Zimri, the son of Salu, and he was the Nazi for the tribe of Shimon. So some say that's a different person, but many people say that's the same guy. This guy, Shlumi Amin Shaddai, is also Zimri ben Salu, which is pretty crazy, right? That you have the same guy. Now, there's a medrash that says he had three names. He had the name Shlumi Amin Shaddai, very from name. Zimri ben Salu, which the Gemara speaks about, that Zimri and Salu comes from, that has to do with the Averis that he did, the Averis that he committed. And lastly, you have also Shaul ben Aknanis. It's interesting, he's called Shaul ben Aknanis because Shaul ben Aknanis, you read about Shimon's children. One of Shimon's children was Shaul ben Aknanis. And they say, Knanis is Dina. And it was a child that Shimon had together with Dina. Dina didn't want to leave the household of Shechem. And Shimon promised to marry her. And then they came. So there's, there's a whole story about the Shaul ben, you know, who the Shaul ben Aknanis is. Is he a mamza? What's the story? Because this is actually a brother. To married to a sister, and this brother and sister are both paternally and maternally sisters, right? Because Shimon and Dina had the same parents, the exact same parents. Can't we say, well, there was Yaakov was involved, but one was Rachel and one was Leah. Both children of Yaakov and both children of Leah. Yeah? So you have a real issue over here. You have Yaakov, Leah, you have all this. So, um, so they say that it's not necessarily true that he's the Shaul ben Akhananis from then because he would be like 250 years old. Uh, this is Shimon's child that came down to Egypt. Yeah, so it's a minimum of 250 years because it's been 40 years in the desert so by the time the story happened over there in Shittim, together with 210 years in, in Egypt. So that's 250 years. And he was, you know, so this guy was 26 years old or something like that. Okay, so they say it's not him. But in the end of the day, he says, how did we go from Shlumiel ben Suri Shaddai to Zimri ben Salu. And one of the things he speaks about here is the idea of a Jewish name. He said that what the Shlumi Amin Sur Shaddai did, he changed his name to Shaul ben Aknanis. And by changing his name, that had an effect. It's very interesting to note, Rabbi Wine speaks about this when it comes to the Greeks. When Alexander the Great made his way into Eretz Yisrael, he almost took over Jerusalem. And the Shamron and the Kusim wanted him to destroy the temple. And Shimon Atzadik, who was the Kohen Gadol and the leader of the Jewish people, comes out at the time to greet Alexander the Great. And Alexander, according to the way the Gemara has it, Alexander the Great got off of his horse and he bowed down to Shimon Atzadik. And he says, every time I go into battle, I see an apparition of a very holy man. And this is the man that I've seen. And that's why I'm bowing down to him. And Shimon Atzadik says, look, we are, we're your servants. We're your slaves. We want, to, we want to be part of your kingdom. Don't destroy the temple. And we will give you three things in return for it. Number one, taxes. A certain amount of taxes that they were going to give him. Number two, I guess they were going to become his slaves. And number three, I think that's the two things. I can't remember. The third one is that they were going to name every boy that was born that year Alexander. Correct? That was one of the promises. And that's how the name Alexander became a Jewish name. It's not really a Jewish name. It's a Greek name. San Alexander makes its way into Jewish names because they promised Alexander the Great that he would become 
the one that everybody will be named after. So now, says Rabbi Wein, that Alexander became a Jewish name, it actually became a real issue, became a real problem, because it opened up the floodgates. Well, if you can name your kid Alexander, why can't you name your kid Antigone? So you have Antigone Shisoho. And people started having Greek names. It's interesting, I had this conversation once with a friend of mine who his first child was born, and they wanted to name the child, and his father-in-law's mother was called something Charna. I think it was Rifka Charna. I can't remember what her first name was. First name was a pretty standard name. And the second name was Charna. And he's like, I don't like Charna. He says, yeah, but my wife wants it. And it's, and he's like, but that's, that's not a Jewish name. So like, yes, it is. He's like, well, what does Charna mean? So Charna really is, it seems to be Charna is a Hungarian word that means darkness. And when somebody was very be beautiful, very pretty, they call them Chana because they don't want to, they want an iron her out. But he says, for the same price, I could call my daughter Destiny. You know, I could call her Penelope. Because why is Chana any better than Penelope? I wouldn't call my daughter Penelope. I want to give a Jewish name. So how does Chana become a Jewish name? But certain names became accepted. Goldie, Simi, Friday, a lot of the Yiddish names actually made their way into our vocabulary just in the in the recent years it's not something a name that people used to always give their children so but if you open up the floodgates to certain names with it comes certain influences and there was a tremendous amount of greek influence once the jewish people started to call themselves greek names they started to feel greek okay when you're yankel and suddenly you become jack so going from Yankel to Jack is a difference because now I'm not anymore Yankel Goldberg, I'm Jack Goldberg. And Jack Goldberg starts to feel, well, I've moved over to Jack. Goldberg is a very, very Jewish name. Maybe I'll call myself Gould, G-O-U-L-D. Instead of Gold, Gold is still Jewish, but Gould might not be so Jewish, right? Or maybe I'll give myself an entirely different name because if I already changed Yankel to Jack, I might as well change the other names that go with it also. And you start to see a lot, you know, in Mitzrayim, one of the things that they didn't change was they didn't change their names. And that was one of the things that God still saw for them as a tremendous, righteous, tremendously righteous thing that they had done. It stood them in good stead that they didn't change their names. There was still a Jewish Tom to them because they had a Jewish name. He was still called Yankel, not Jack. And when he changes his name from Shlumiel, Ben Surishara, to such a Jewish name, he changes it to Shob Ben Aknanis. Shoal as in a borrowed name. Knan is a Knanite name. That's a slippery slope that could lead to Zimri ben Salom. That's what you do. Got to be careful. Oftentimes, when you start letting in the wrong influences, you start a slippery slope. You got to be careful with those influences. You never know what becomes from even just the small change of a name. The small change of a name could have a massive impact on the way people behave. When you're Yaakov or when you're Jack, two different people. I know lots of people that have sort of strayed from the path. One of the things they like to do is they don't want to be known as Yanko. You know, who, who goes clubbing? You imagine walking into a club and this girl walks over and goes, hey, what's your name? Yanko. What kind of name is that? Like, you know, you want to say Jack. No one wants to say Yanko to a girl in a club. You feel like a loser. So you get rid of that because you got to get rid of that facade. I'm not, I'm not this from Jew anymore. The name Yanko just screams, I'm Orthodox. <laughs> right? So that's the thing. You start to get rid of certain things and the slippery slope, it goes in the wrong direction. So that's the ideas I wanted to share with you tonight. Thank you again for joining me, guys. I, I always appreciate that. Michael and Ivor, I'm sorry I didn't announce before that we're having this show. I'm glad you stayed behind anyway. Thank you with you guys. Thank you for those who came on Facebook Live, to those of you who are on Zoom, and also to those on Twitter. Anytime any would like to get in touch, David Eisenberg at And I hope you tune in again next week. Thank you, Mochi.